Okay, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining today's PMAP webinar on a new age of capitalism in the Philippines, which is a joint project of our MAP Management and Human Capital Development Committee and the MAP Corporate Governance Committee. I am Monse Gismundo, and I'm the MC moderator and reactor for today's webinar. Please settle down comfortably, and we will now begin our program. May I request everyone to pause and bow our heads for a short prayer to be followed by the Philippine National Anthem. Slide on the prayer, please. Our most merciful God, we come to you in our weakness. We come to you in our fear. We come to you with trust, for you alone are our hope. We place before you the disease present in our world. We turn to you in our time of need. Bring wisdom to doctors, give understanding to scientists, and though caregivers with the compassion and generosity, bring healing to those who are ill, protect those who are at most at risk, give comfort to those who have lost a loved one, welcome those who have died into your eternal home, stabilize our communities, unite us in our compassion, remove all fears from our hearts, fill us with confidence in your, in your care, amen. Amen. Philippine National Anthem. Mga kababayan, ang pambansang awit ng Pilipinas. Thank you. And may I now call on Attorney Emerico Rico O. de Guzman, the Management and Human Capital Development Committee Chairman, to deliver the welcome remarks. Rico. Thank you, Mon. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for attending uh, this afternoon session um, of um, the MAP CEO Academy. Um, thank you to the MAP Corporate Governance Committee for COSPOD co-sponsoring this webinar. Uh, at the outset, let me thank our uh, esteemed speaker, uh, Dr. Nick, Nick Poblador, uh, and the reactor, Secretary Coloma, uh, Yumon, uh, Dr. Ben T. Hanke, and uh, Dean Cesar Villanueva, my um, babayan, uh, for sharing their expertise with us uh, on this uh, interesting topic of uh, the new age of capitalism in the Philippines. Um, in today's web webinar, hopefully at the end of the day, we will be enlightened by our speaker and the re reactors uh, on their insights uh, on the strategy in this new age, uh, uh, particularly on the implications of uh, various stakeholder strategies relating to corporate governance, uh, the common good of, of all stakeholders, uh, with a critique on um, stakeholder capitalism. And uh, hopefully we would have integrated the framework for greater coherence uh, in the discussions today. No? Today's event um, is in line with uh, the MAPS board uh, theme of the Great Reset, no? uh, leading for the common good, and uh, meant to address uh, social justice uh, among our mids, in our mids, um, as mentioned by our uh, MAP president, Gigi Montinola, uh, during his uh, inaugural address. No? For this year, uh, our committee uh, plans to organize uh, 
uh, as uh, many webinars as possible to address uh, the various uh, concerns raised by uh, the MAP members uh, in that survey sent by the uh, Secretariat. We also would uh, hold the usual um, PMAP MAP, uh, annual general membership meeting. And um, uh, we aim also to conduct a lifelong learning, uh, which will transform uh, the AIM MAP management educators workshop uh, from uh, sharing uh, latest management ideas and frameworks to um, a uh, whole country human resource uh, strat strategy, hopefully, no? And then uh, hopefully also this year, we would like to conduct um, uh, a number of mat uh, management educators workshops or a workshop uh, if possible um, uh, as part of uh, the the, the, the program of the committee uh, to um, uh, educate our fellow members uh, and their uh, fellow managers. No? Uh, so uh, thank you uh, one and all for spending time this afternoon to be with us at this uh, interesting webinar. Thank you, Mon. Uh, welcome everyone. Maraming salamat, Asamang Rico, at we are conducting this webinar under the MAPCO Academy, which serves as the umbrella brand for MAP activities that address the continuing education of MAP members and other management practitioners and the sharing of the latest technologies and information on management and leadership. Now, some reminders, please, before we start the presentation. As participants for, the, for this webinar, you are automatically muted and your camera or video is also automatically off, even if you want to see your faces. You may submit your questions through the Q&A button that you see on your screen. You will only be able to see our speaker and reactors, but you will not be able to view the other participants. And lastly, in case you lose connection, of course, try to reconnect again. Join us again by repeating what you did earlier in logging in. In line with MAP policy, we will dispense with the lengthy introduction of our speakers and reactors. We will just flash a slide on the profile highlights of each speaker and reactors. For the presentation on strategy in the new age of capitalism, may I call on the management and economics thought leader and retired professor of economics and management, and now professorial lecturer of the University of the Philippines at the eve of his 85th birthday, Dr. Niseto Nick S. Poblador. Um, we're grateful to God for giving Nick to the Philippines. Happy birthday, Nick. Salamat. Salamat, man. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you all for coming to this uh, forum and giving me the, uh, the, this opportunity to expound on some ideas which uh, have been festering in my mind for so many years now. Uh, hopefully, uh, uh, the, the, con the confluence of uh, circumstances have given me the occasion to, uh, to uh, express this with you and share thoughts with you. I will now make my, my presentation. I will share my uh, PowerPoint deck with you in a moment. This slide shows the title page of my book entitled Strategy in the New Age of Capitalism, Collaborative and Exclusive Approaches to Value Creation. Uh, this book will be published by the University, University of the Philippines Press uh, hopefully um, within, <laughs> within the very near future. And uh, I expect to see you all at a book launch. This presentation and my book takes a long hard look at business strategy and corporate governance in today's world against the backdrop of destabilizing changes taking place in the global economy. 
Uh, Nick, you're not yet projecting your slides. I am. Um, you may just want to double check. Yes, please. Arnold, I am sharing my, my, my screen. Yes. Yes, please do, but we can see it, Dr. Nick. Okay, you can see it now? No. Not yet. Uh, kindly press the share screen button and then press the share button in that particular window. Okay, there is the share button, share screen, I press it. Yes. Oh, I see. Akala po pa nakikita umiilaw eh. Nasa activity bar kasi yung aking, okay, got it. There you are. There you go. Okay, I'll start from the beginning. Yes. Okay. Okay. The, the, this slide is the is the title page of my forthcoming book to be published by the UP uh, UP Press. Hopefully, very soon. And Doctor Nick, please press the this presentation in the lower right hand corner, uh, beside the eighty six percent, beside the eighty six percent to the left of the eighty six percent. There is a screen icon, so please kindly click. I'm looking for it right now. Lower. Yeah, lower right hand, there is a number, 86%. To the left of that, there is a screen. 66%. 86, 86%. Ah, ah ayun, oh, 86%. Ito, yang... oh, I got it, mama. And then I to the left, it. Oh, okay. kindly click on, on the screen icon. You see an icon? Nasa Are 100% you... na. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm talking about to the left of the number, there's a screen. Yes. To the left, to the left. There, yeah. Uh, please. Ah, please. okay. There you go. Fantastic. Okay, now how, how do I get rid of the... Uh, of your images of the, of the left, uh, right side of my uh, screen. I okay, let's go ito. Okay. Okay, na. okay. All right. Now, I, 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 I made the references to, to uh, transformational changes taking place in the global economy, and uh, they are the following three sets of forces that are disrupting the global economy. The transformative changes in technolo transformative technological changes brought about by the fourth industrial revolution. This includes, of course, artificial intelligence, robotics, three 3D uh, printing, and so on and so forth. Disruption in the global political economic order, notably the breakdown of globalization. Uh, hold on a minute. Increasing nationalism and growing political extremism. Mm -hmm. And then the deadly corona, uh, coronavirus pandemic, which we all know is the worst in living memory. All right, part one of my book, of my presentation, Rethinking Shareholder Wealth Maximization. By a long standing tradition, corporations have pursued only one goal, and that is the maximization of shareholder wealth, which is the corporate interpretation of the neoclassical dictum maximization of profit. Shareholder wealth maximization has historical roots in profit maximization. Assumption of the, uh, the, the profit maximization assumption of neoclassical economics. And it has intellectual moorings in the teachings of Milton Friedman. Since the beginning of the 20th century, capitalism has served business and society well. It provided the primary driving force behind the entrepreneurial spirit that led to the tremendous technological innovations, the creation of enormous material wealth, and until recently, the eradication of widespread poverty. It made the US the world's leading superpower since the end of World War II and the undisputed champion of neoliberalism and global economic integration. 
it ha the capitalism has led, of course, to has ushered in uh, an era of what we know and what is known as Pax Americana, which started soon after the uh, the end of World War II and lasted up till about well until 2016 when uh, Trump decided to withdraw the U.S. from the global stage in order to make America great again. It, ha it also has its drawbacks, of course. It left the average worker with no safety net from economic decision. Just now, for example, we have noticed that millions of workers have been out of job, workers in the in certain industries, such as, for example, Ayan, maximum. Tourism. Yung sound out. So, pwede akong modulate. All right. And of course, we, you you must have noticed uh, in recent uh, recent weeks uh, the proliferation of uh, former uh, jeepney drivers begging in the streets. It has engendered a political system that is prone to capture by vested interest, also known as corruption. And in the last 30 years, capitalistic societies have witnessed a dramatic increase in economic inequality and lack of economic opportunities and worsening living conditions among large segments of society. And this graph shows dramatically the uh, uneven distribution of wealth and income on a global scale. You will notice in this diagram that the bar representing the, uh, the wealth of the top 20% of the global population is much larger than the cumulative sum of the corresponding bars of the, of the bottom 80%. And the same is true in regard to income. Even more dramatically, Oxfam has noted that, uh, that uh, the top 1% population of the world owns more than 50% of total wealth. There is widespread belief that business has been primarily responsible for the growing economic inequality and poor access to economic opportunities among the most economically deprived members of society. Part two of this presentation looks at the reactions to shareholder wealth maximization. In recent years, there has been increasing disenchantment with shareholder wealth maximization from civil society and more importantly for us, from some progressive elements in the business community itself. On August 19, 2019, the Influential Business Roundtable, Business Roundtable, which is comprised of uh, over 200 CEOs of the top American corporations, formally abandoned its long-standing advocacy of shareholder wealth maximization as the main purpose of business corporations and formally adopted a statement of purpose of the corporation. With this proclamation, the BRP committed corporate America to creating value for all stakeholders. And the following are the five, five-fold mission of the BRP, one, to deliver value to customers, two, to invest in employees, to fairly and ethically deal with suppliers, to support communities in which we work, and finally, to generate long-term value for shareholders. The, this list uh, is uh, not worthy for one thing, but it, it considers the, the interest of share, shareholder last suggesting perhaps that uh, the that, uh, shareholder primacy has finally has finally uh, given way to the, the uh, interest of all other stakeholders, notably the customers. And uh, also we would want to note that in item five, it stresses long-term value, long-term value, suggesting that the BRT is also uh, 
moving away from the long tradition of uh, short-termism, the focus on immediate business results. Over a year later, the largest business and professional organizations in the Philippines, collectively known as the Philippine Business Groups, signed a covenant of shared prosperity. Dr. Ben Kihanke, of course, is, a, is the map uh, uh, spokesman or representative for, the, for this uh, covenant, uh, by which they upheld the universal issues of economic and social inequality and non inclusivity by ensuring ethical wealth creation and the sharing of prosperity with all stakeholders. The Management Association of the Philippines is a major signatory to this covenant. Um, my own thinking about businesses getting together to, uh, to serve the interest of the larger, larger society is that what businesses can do is to collaborate among themselves and with other entities in the community, civil society, NGOs, the church, in coming up with a, with a common platform uh, to serve the interest of society and to save the planet. So I, the, there's a danger forever in, uh, in this sort of collaborative effort in that it might be interpreted as creating an alternative state, an alter alternative arrangement to the state whose main responsibility is to capture externalities, the external effects of the activities of business firms and other entities in society. So collaboration in a, on a much larger scale involving businesses and other institutions in society. On December 20, a group of global business leaders conversed at the Holy See, another attempt to collectively come up with a joint statement. In this case, a fairer, more inclusive and sustainable economic foundation for the world. And of course, the World Economic Forum has been a primary mover of stakeholder capitalism, an approach to business and economic policy that looks beyond the interest of shareholders and toward, and toward the well-being of society. These uh, statements uh, of multiple corporate objectives have a number of historical precedents. I just mentioned two of them, triple bottom line and environmental, social, and governance standards that are uh, used to, uh, to, to uh, by socially uh, conscious investors to screen potential investments. Triple bottom line in particular has been with us for quite a long time. Now, by all indications, stakeholder capitalism appears to be the new mantra in the corporate world, stakeholder capitalism. There have been notable objectors to stakeholder capitalism, notably from, from, cap, from academia. Harvard uh, Law Professor Lucien Bubeck and University of Chicago Finance Professor Raghuram Rajan. These institutions represent opposite ends in the uh, ideological spectrum. One very liberal, the other very conservative. Now, part three of my presentation gives the position of this presentation the position of my book likewise. All stakeholder strategies assume that businesses have the moral responsibility to serve the economic interests of stakeholders, an ethical obligation. There are, however, a number of unanswered questions. Given the resource constraints and limits to productive capacity. What should be the basis for allocating economic value among stakeholders? 
how should conflicting interests of stakeholders be reconciled? Now, simultaneously aiming for several goals, to my mind, is problematic because creating value for all stakeholders in the company deprives its managers of an, an equitable criterion for making rational choices. By aiming to create value for all stakeholders, any strategic decision is acceptable as for as long as it creates value for somebody, no matter how much or how little. Consequently, decision makers are unable to determine what is the best or optimal solution. To my mind, for this purpose, the firm must pursue only one goal, only one strategy, only one variable by which all others are measured, and that is profit or shareholder wealth maximization. So I now proceed to defining the role of the firm in modern society. Uh, in my thinking, in looking at the role of the firm in today's world, we have to have a, a, a much wider social science perspective. We take insights from Darwinism, which tell us that all participants in production, in the production process are driven by self interest. And in line with sociologist Talcott Parsons' theory of social functionalism, we define the role of the firm in modern society as one of creating economic value and appropriating the economic wealth created among all groups that contribute to the production process. There are a number of alternative strategies by which firms can co-align the financial interests of their owners and those of the other groups that have a stake in the business. One is to create one is to create value for customers through product and service development to better serve their needs by offering generous prices and by providing adequate customer care. To create value for workers by offering comfortable wages and other performance based financial benefits, by creating an organizational culture that is conducive to information sharing and collaboration, and by de developing ample resources to maintain a high level of productivity, primarily through skills development and investment in new production technologies. Creating value for business partners by engaging suppliers and distribution and distributors in a mutually beneficial and trusting collaboration, collaborative relationship. And to create value for the rest of society. In my thinking, this is done primarily through what are called inclusive business models, which are solutions that provide access to economic opportunities to low income communities in all manner, in a manner that will make business more viable and sustainable. Now, many corporate initiatives that pass for corporate responsibility have an underlying strategic agenda. I seem to be missing some slides in my presentation. I wonder if I skip some of them. Let me just proceed. Now, the economic value allotted to stakeholders in a production process constitute the incentive for which for, for their active participation in the production process. And the residual that the residual value that remains with a firm provides the incentive to the investors in the business. Now uh, that residual is called profit. It is what remains after the value created by the firm is allocated among those who participated in the production process. 
And this is what drives capitalism as an economic system, the profit motive. The resources that are employed by, the, by firms in pursuing these stakeholder strategies are the nature of investments intended to enhance long-term productive productivity and to ensure sustained shareholder wealth creation over the life of the enterprise and not operational costs to be minimized in order to achieve immediate gains to the orders. I seem to have missed a number of slides. I'm sorry, I have, let me go back for a while. I have some notes here. I, don't, I just don't remember what slide number this is, but uh, I talk about stakeholder strategies that assume a moral responsibility to serve the economic interest of stakeholders. This is a very important point that I wish to stress because it comes in some indirect conflict with the common interpretation of corporate social responsibility. Uh, corporate social responsibility let me just talk extemporaneous now, assumes that businesses have the ethical, the moral responsibility to serve the interests of society, to serve the interest of everybody who contributes to the production process. Now, uh, in, my, in my thinking, businesses and the, and the managers that, that are trying businesses have no moral responsibility to serve the interest of everybody else. The responsibility of corporate managers, well, as corporate managers, is a strategic, not an ethical responsibility, a strategic responsibility. I don't recall having shown the slide where I emphasize that Corporate managers have no ethical responsibility, but they do have a strategic responsibility. Strategic, we mean to serve a long run goal for the company. By contrast, ethical suggests doing something to serve the interest of others. Strategic, I must emphasize, is to serve the interest of the company, of shareholders. Now, many managers are in a, in a difficult situation because uh, they are facing a situation called role conflict. So individuals in any context occupy different roles, all right? And uh, uh, the role of managers as managers is to create value for the company. Now, what managers do and what others do like for, uh, what other uh, individuals who are part of the corporation do with their wealth is their business. So moral responsibility as against strategic responsibility. I mentioned this often. I go back now. I've gone through this before. Now, I note, that, I note here that corp many corporate initiatives pass for corporate responsibility, but they do have an underlying strategic agenda. Let me glance at my notes for this purpose. But this is a very important point I want to stress. I noticed, for example, the, uh, the collaboration between in Big Pharma to develop, distribute, uh, to develop and distribute COVID-19 vaccine. Uh, this could easily be seen as a, a, a gesture on the part of uh, Pfizer and uh, other drug companies to serve the interest of, the, of society, to help 
to help uh, stop the uh, the uh, raging pand uh, pandemic. But uh, the underlying st uh, strategy behind this move is to develop the long run market for uh, the, their long run uh, their long run markets because in the in the uh, following uh, for the following uh, generations the health industry will become a major industry and these companies want to position themselves beforehand i also notice uh, efforts by well known companies in the in the, in, the, in, in this country among them of course the media corporation and the ayala group of companies trying to maintain a near normal relationship with their uh, with their customers with their suppliers and then with their employees in the light of the pandemic. Uh, again, this can easily be seen as being kind hearted, being generous, and being being concerned with the well being of our workers, consumers, and others, which is true. But the underlying strategy here in my thinking is that these companies want to be well positioned. To, uh, to resume normal operations once the pandemic is over, and they want to make to uh, hold on to their their supply chains as best as they can. So, again, what appears to be a generous uh, gen uh, acts of generosity on the part of companies are in fact intended to achieve a long run strategic objective. Arnold, I'm sorry, I seem to have missed a very important slide. Uh, would do you mind if I try to locate it for a while? Kasi dito sa ano, in a minute. Please be patient with me. I'm looking at, at my notes now. Nick, this is Ben. Yes, Ben. Uh, do you remember the heading so we can help you trace it? I have your deck. Okay, let me see now. Uh, let me go back to slide 20, 25. Let me see now, 12, slide 25. Aiming for several goals. At all, okay. Hold on. Go to project. You'll need to click at the screen again okay. at the bottom, right? Oh, tapos pero ko dito. Eto. Uh, and then I can. The last uh, part says what? Well, consequently, decision makers are on okay. For this purpose, firms must pursue only one goal. And in my thinking, that goal is shareholder wealth maximization. Now, it would appear. Okay, we are now on slide 26. Okay it would appear that we are back to square one. Balik tayo shareholder wealth maximization. For all this talk about stakeholder share uh, stakeholder wealth creation, we are now back to shareholder wealth maximization. While I, I, I am advocating that we go back to shareholder wealth maximization, I have, however, a very important caveat, a very important caveat, which I want to stress in this presentation. And I seem to have missed this earlier on. I don't know. Data ko lang na konti ito. Ah, ito. This is, this is a major focus of my presentation. I wonder why I skipped it earlier on. Companies, in my thinking, 
can both be focused on shareholder wealth maximization and committed to the economic interest of all other stakeholders at the same time. In other words, we're back to stakeholders uh, value maxim uh, stakeholder wealth maximization, shareholder wealth maximization, but we also are advocating creating value for all stakeholders because in my thinking, doing so would enable the firm to create more value for everybody. All right. So going back to stakeholder wealth, shareholder wealth maximization requires a radical change in the manner by which businesses take to achieve their profit objectives. Now, this is a major theme of my presentation and I seem to have skipped it earlier on unless uh, I did so and now you completely escape, escape me. So ito ang aking position. We must pursue a radically different way of doing business. And uh, then I, I go, go to this larger so, social role of the role of the role of society, or the, I mean, the role of the firm of creating value for society. Moving on forward, let me then I I talk about I have made reference to Talcott Parsons' uh, social functionalism, which views the firm along with other social institutions, the church, the state, charitable organizations, and so on, as specialized specialized. Uh, entities in society performing a specific function for for society the role of business as business firms is to create economic value then i go on i talk about alternative strategies by which firms can create value for stakeholders and at the same time contribute to the profitability of the business Okay, so we went through this earlier on. And we can now proceed to the concluding parts of my presentation. And I noted earlier that many corporate initiatives tasked with corporate responsibility have in, a, in fact an underlying strategic agenda. Now, so I have compared two strategies. One strategy uh, is to uh, create, is to work. Uh, is to maximize production, current production. And the other strategy is to maximize the sustainability and profitability, the long run sustainability and profitability of the, of the enterprise. This, the, the, these two strategies are compared as follows. One creates value for all stakeholders, while the other creates value solely for owners. One result in a larger economic pie for all to share, while the other ensures shareholders a bigger slice of a given size pie at the expense of all others. Using the language of, uh, of, of, of game theory, one is a positive sum game, while the other is a zero sum game. And I illustrate this with this diagram. I, in this diagram, I, uh, I have one image superimposed on another. The larger image, I mean, the smaller image shows uh, a larger proportionate share of a small pie, while the other shows a smaller proportionate share of a much bigger pie. And if you compare the sizes of the chunks that go to the, uh, to the firm, the blue one is obviously much larger than the red one the blue being the result of stakeholder strategies, where the old one, the result of traditional shareholder wealth maximization strategy. Then I make a final uh, digression, lessons learned from the COVID-19 pandemic. If anything, the COVID-19 pandemic has sent the powerful message to corporate managers the world over that their economic fortunes and those of their other stakeholders are intimately and inextricably intertwined. And that what benefits or adversely affects one will also be felt by all others. The realization that we are all in this together 
has tended to foster closer ties between business and their stakeholders. That's the end of my presentation. Thank you so much for being patient with me. And for a little, a little confusion earlier on when I seem to have missed certain slides. <laughs> okay, that's it. Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Nick. So you have certainly set the stage for a spirited uh, debate and a fiery discussion. And now, may I call on our first reactor, the EBP of Manila Bulletin Publishing Corporation and former secretary of the Presidential Community Operations Office, ECOO, Secretary Sani Coloma. Good afternoon, friends. I'd like to greet especially my uh, former colleague, uh, Nick Poblador, advance happy birthday. And our uh, fellow panelists. Uh, may I be allowed to share screen? Yeah, are you able to see my screen now? Yes. Mercury. Yes, yes, we can see it. Oh, okay. Thank you. Uh, let's ask the others. Sunny, I can see the Mercury news. Is that what you want to show? No, no, no. Uh, excuse me. You may need to unshare and then choose the screen that you need to show. I will stop sharing first. Okay, are you seeing now the PowerPoint? Yes. yes. Okay, let me start. Uh, the title that was given to my presentation is A Critique of Stakeholder Capitalism. Far be it for me to critique my esteemed friend, Dr. Nick Poblador, especially on, his, on the eve of his birthday. Uh, this will not be a, a critique, Nick. This is an augmentation of your exposition of the concept of stakeholder capitalism. I would like to thank you for especially emphasizing three important points. First point, there is widespread belief that business has been primarily responsible for the growing economic inequality and poor access to economic opportunities among the most economically deprived members of society. Secondly, and I think this is one of the main points that you emphasize when you went back to your slides. There is a concept of simulta uh, that simultaneously aiming for several goals is problematic. And for this purpose, it would be better if firms would pursue only one goal. And that goal remains to be shareholder wealth maximization. And number three, in response to the observation that shareholder wealth maximization may have created some uh, inauspicious results, there is a countervailing strategy, which is to co-align the financial interests of owners and those of other business stakeholders. And uh, Nick Poblador, shared with us some specific ways by which there would be a creation of more value for customers, workers, business partners, and the rest of society. And to the point of uh, addressing the needs of the rest of society, the advocacy is to adopt inclusive business models that would provide low-income communities greater access to economic opportunities in a manner that will make businesses more viable and sustainable. I would like to augment the exposition made by Nick by discussing a collection of essays compiled in a book called Reimagining Capitalism. This is the book. It is edited by Barton, Horvath, and Kipping 
It is a project of the Schulich School of Business of York University in Toronto and of McKinsey and Company in collaboration with about 25 leading proponents from the academe, the business sector, and the non-government sector who are advocates for a reformed and reimagined capitalism. And one of their basic propositions is this. This time is different because it has to be framed against the backdrop of the Great Recession of 2008-2009 in a long-term historical perspective. There has been a general failure to deal with externalities. And so we have a climate change crisis that has wrought tremendous biophysical damage. There continues to be a bias against the future in terms of discount rates that make future benefits worthless and a continuing obsession with short-term performance. This time is different because it has to be in terms of the stark realities, the huge chasm between the haves and have-nots. The 1.2 billion poorest only account for 1% of global consumption. The 1 billion richest account for 75% of global output. The 62 world's richest have combined assets equal to the 3.6 billion poorest. Half of the world own no more than a tiny elite whose members would all sit comfortably in a train carriage. So the continuing advocacy of capitalism has promoted efficiency and maximum economic value, but not well-being, shared community, trust, and purpose. And so among the essays in this collection of reimagining capitalism is the lead article entitled Reestablishing Trust, Making Business with Purpose, the Purpose of Business. It is authored by Paul Polman. He has an interesting name. He's from the Netherlands. His actual real name is Paulus Gregorius Josephus Maria Polman, nicknamed Paul. He was the CEO of Unilever from 2009 and 2019, a full decade and chairman of the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, as well as recipient of the UN Environment Program Champion of the Earth Award. And in this article, what is emphasized is the power of one, what a single company could do. Unilever rolled out a sustainable living plan that reached 1.3 billion through health and hygiene programs, reduce the total waste footprint per consumer use of their products by 32%, achieving zero waste to landfill across all factories, reduce greenhouse gas emissions from their own manufacturing by 65%, achieving 100% renewable grid electricity across all sites, reduce sugar across all their sweetened tea-based beverages by 23%, and 56% of their funds portfolio now meets the recognized high nutrition standards. They also enable 2.34 million women to access initiatives aiming to promote their safety, develop their skills, or expand their opportunities. Hence, they have moved towards a gender-balanced workplace in which 51% of management roles are held by women. They have a Unilever compass that is rooted or anchored upon three core beliefs. Brands with purpose grow. Companies with purpose last. And people with purpose thrive. I would like to conclude my brief reaction with a postscript. And the postscript is as follows. An image came to mind of development as a pool of money 
spreading out across the Asian countryside, consuming life wherever it touched. It was as if money itself had become an evil motive force, absorbing intelligent and highly defined living beings and communities to grow its own featureless bulk. Money, consuming life to grow money. Of course, this, uh, this quotation is attributed to David Corten from the book Agenda for a New Economy. And he continues, consumed by our quest for money, we fail to notice that we have relinquished control of our lives to the institutions that control our access to money. We accept our enslavement to institutions for which we are merely a means to an end, alien to our own existence and well-being. I have here a dialogue between David and Sixto. David Corten lived for two decades in Asia, Latin America, and Africa. And he did a stint in the Philippines. And this is how I met him at the AIM. And his conversation is with Dr. Sixto K. Rojas. And David Corten asked Dr. Rojas the question, why do economists prescribe solutions that ruin the economy and ecology? And the answer of Ting Rojas was, that's easy. They choose the firm rather than the household as their basic unit of analysis. The word economics comes from the ancient Greek word oikonomia, meaning household economies. And the classical economists viewed the economy through that lens. But Sixto Rojas continues, when the founders of contemporary economics sought to raise economics to the stature of a science by basing it on a mathematical model, they chose the firm because its transactions are monetized and therefore already quantified. Economists have since viewed the economy through the lens of the profit-seeking firm rather than that of the life-seeking household. And so, I friend, my friends, I leave you with this thought from David Corten who said, and I quote, we will prosper in the pursuit of life or we will perish in the pursuit of money. The choice is ours. Thank you and good afternoon. Uh, thank you, uh, Secretary Sunny. And uh, the pursuit of life is mabuhay, right? Mabuhay. Our second reactor is a professor of business ethics at De La Salle University and co-chair of the MAP Social Justice Committee's Subcommittee for Covenant for Shared Prosperity. Let us all welcome Dr. Benito Ben L. Tihanki. Ben? Hi, Mon. Can you see my screen? Yes, please. Yes, we can. All right, thank you. Uh, first, I need to uh, outline what I plan to say in reaction to Dr. Poblador's very important remarks this afternoon. So basically, I'll focus on three points. The first being the role of economists in really updating our view of what business needs to do in the modern world. Uh, the second is my strong agreement with the core argument of Dr. Poblador that companies need to radically change the way they seek profits. Uh, but my third point is to push his argument further because he holds back and says that the argument is mainly strategic. I will push the argument that it is also a moral argument. So let me elaborate on the first point. When I was reflecting on the fact that Nick is about to reach 85 years of age, I asked myself, maybe God had a special mission for Nick because I believe that economists really have a special duty to update our thinking on the role of business in the modern world. When I was born in 1962, Milton Friedman published his famous book, Free to Choose. And that was when he first made his point that social responsibility should not be the concern of business. In fact, 
he made the point that if businesses are encouraged to seek social responsibility, this will only encourage a, tot a totalitarian uh, state or a new form of totalitarianism. Therefore, what followed was this market fundamentalism that swept through the whole world, of course, led by the Americans, that somehow a rising boat raises all tides, a rising tide rather raises all boats and the trickle down effect of the growth of the economy will benefit everyone. But what we saw with market fundamentalism is that instead of trickle down, it is trickle up. And therefore we've seen more and more concentration of wealth among very few. And this could not have been done without the corporate structure. And what we've seen also is that the environment has been despoiled in many ways that we can, now, we can never recover. Uh, recently in 2014, Jean Tirol of the University of Toulouse was given the Nobel Prize for arguing for the stakeholder economy. So I believe along with uh, Dr. Poblador, Jean Tirol is saying that it is really time to upgrade our fundamental conception of the firm. So I thank Dr. Poblador for making these important remarks. My second reaction is that Dr. Poblador is arguing that it doesn't have to be an either or. Profits and the benefits of stakeholders can come together. However, it needs to come at the at the setting aside of short-term short thinking. So what he is arguing is for a longer, therefore a strategic horizon for businesses. And I, de and I dare say that many business leaders have always uh, you know, thought in this way. They're not really that short-term in their perspective. But what happens if short-term thinking is what dominates? What we can see is that the profit goals are often assumed at the expense of stakeholders. So let me just highlight one key stakeholder, that of employees. We have seen that in many modern economies, such as the US, we have seen that the ratio of the top pay of executives have become higher and higher relative to the average pay of employees. In the US, it was about, it was about uh, seven, uh, 70 to one in the 80s, and then it became uh, more than 300 to one. And so therefore, what we would like to see is that as the profit goal is achieved, that the employee's welfare is also uplifted. Sorry, Dr. Ben, there's a request from one of the uh, attendees to make it full screen. Oh, all right. Sorry. What are you able to see now, Mon? Uh, it's uh, not a full screen. It's got the notes in addition to the slide. All right, thank you for the feedback. What about now, Mon? Fantastic. Okay. So let me go to my, uh, let me just finish my second point. That if the profit goal is pursued, but without being mindful of the benefits of stakeholders, we have extremely exploitative situations that arise. And I can only emphasize that in the case of labor, this leads to uh, outright misery in many cases when employees are paid so little or have few benefits or even the security of tenure while executives or even top shareholders uh, get the lion's share of the economic benefits of the firm. And, and finally, I build on my uh, third point, which is to say that I would like to use uh, Dr. Poblador's argument as a platform to say that uh, we can push beyond strategic argument and say it is a moral argument. If we reflect upon it, business is not a natural right. Anyone who wants to set up a business in the Philippines or in most Republican democracies, they have to file for a permit. Therefore, the government reserves the right to grant or not to grant the authority to run a business. And the reasoning is simple because business is always a mixed uh, outcome. That means that somebody who is given permission to run a business may do, may do so against the interest of others. So therefore, government needs to be very careful. Now, the constitution is very clear. It calls on all economic entities, especially businesses, to contribute to the common good. And this was also echoed in the sponsorship bill for the corporation code in 1979, when it said that our goal for the corporation 
is to set up a valuable institution, the objective of which is not merely profit, but the spreading of the benefits of capitalism for the social and economic development of the country. And more recently, the new code of corporate governance from the SEC emphasizes again the importance of the duty of the board to be mindful of all, all stakeholders when it makes key decisions. So therefore, the fundamental principles that underlie Philippine economic society or economic reality gives a very strong basis for a moral argument for a stakeholder capitalism. That is that businesses cannot afford to simply think of the profits for shareholders, but always know that the moment it was given permit by the government to exist, the duty for it to be mindful of stakeholders already began. And it continues until the end of the life of the company. To say that it's only a, st a strategic duty means that business leaders will only do it if they think it will be profitable to do it. But I argue, and this is pushing uh, the Poblador argument further, is that it is a duty to do it, even if sometimes it will lead in short-term loss, because the rights of stakeholders cannot be sacrificed at the altar of market fundamentalism. Certainly, that is not what our constitution envisions, and that's not what common decency requires. So that's where my reaction ends. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, uh, Dr. Ben. For our third reactor, we have... Uh, Founding partner of uh, Villanueva, the Bionsa, and D Law Offices, and the chair of uh, MAP Corporate Governance Committee, and the former chairman and CEO of GCG, which is the Governance uh, Commission for uh, GOCCs, Government Controlled Corporations, Attorney Cesar Villanueva. Thank you, Mon, and good afternoon to everybody. I have had the pleasure of reading through the manuscript of Dr. Nick Poblador, in fact, twice. First time when he asked me to give a private reaction to the manuscript, and the second time when I was uh, asked to be a reactor to this on this panel. And a reading of the manuscript shows that uh, much of what has uh, been discussed by, by Dr. Nick are based uh, on his Eurodite lecture today is based on those manuscripts. I do look forward to getting a copy of the book once it is published. As a student of the Philippine corporate governance reform movement, I would like to express my professional and personal appreciation for the work of Dr. Nick Poblador. It constitutes an invaluable addition to the literature and research materials upon which to mold for our unique society, both a collaborative and an inclusive approach to the creation of value for all the stakeholders in private corporate sector. In particular, I do like the fact that Dr. Nick Toblador's work does come to the ultimate conclusion that the best way to achieve a collaborative and inclusive approach to the maximization of stakeholders' value would still be the maximization of the company's profits, but not just for the benefit of the shareholders, but really for the long-term benefit of the company and all its stakeholders. In this aspect, Dr. Nick Poblador is truly a student of Milton Friedman, perhaps a reformed student of Milton Friedman. In spite of the recent world economic development that has seen the gap between the top 1,000 and the rest of us ordinary mortals ever getting wider, I continue to be a student of Milton Friedman. And I still adhere to the principle that the role of every stock or for-profit corporation and the manner by which it is supposed to achieve its societal responsibilities as a creature of the law is to create value in society by maximizing the returns on all resources, by making efficient within the pursuit of the corporate business enterprise, the contributions of and returns to the various stakeholders of the company. It is true, of course, that every company is composed of moral individuals, 
and the directors and officers of every stock corporation are moral beings. But their role as members of the board or management must be consistent with the good corporate governance principles of responsibility and accountability, not only to the shareholders, but to all the stakeholders, but that the company remains a business concern and not a charitable institution. The business of business companies remains to be the pursuit of business to achieve profits. But in this new age of capitalism, it means pursuing business profits by balancing the commercial interests of the various stakeholders of the company. How to equitably balance the disparate and at times opposing interests of the various stakeholders of the company is now placed upon the shoulders of the boards and management of publicly held companies and other corporations whose business enterprise is vested with public interests. And that is what the new age of capitalism is all about. I continue to believe in the power of the free market to create value for society because it is the underlying basis upon which a democratic society must operate, where every person has the freedom to choose his livelihood, to keep the fruits of his labor and endeavors, and thereby to be able to pursue the means by which to achieve prosperity and happiness for himself and his family. Like democracy itself, which has its problems and internal contradictions, so, do, so too does the market capitalism. But it does not mean that we should ditch them for communism or, or any of its modern manifestation, which has been shown not to work, nor for state capitalism, where the final verdict is yet to be rendered. The approach that Dr. Nick Poblador's work shows for stakeholder capitalism, in fact, is that, the center, is that in the centerpiece of SEC's codes of corporate governance, where the primary responsibilities of the boards of directors of publicly held companies remain to be the maximization of profits of the company, but with due regard to the interests, not only of the shareholders, but all the other stakeholders. We know very well that there is no enforcement mechanism for the stakeholder capitalism promoted under SEC's corporate code of corporate governance, which remains anchored on the comply or explain approach. In other words, the SEC knows fully well enough to live the business of pursuing business to the businessman. It is the central thesis of Dr. Nico Blader's work that the Filipino businessman, not the government, who are in the best position to employ free market capitalism to evolve a collaborative and exclusive approach to the stakeholders' capitalism in our society. His work is filled with graphs and formulae to prove that when businessmen pursue the best interests of all stakeholders in the pursuit of profits, and not just a single-minded pursuit of maximizing the shareholders' value, the long-term interest of the company is best promoted and society becomes better off. All those graphs and formulae which I had to read twice over remain well beyond my lawyer's mind to appreciate, of course, except for the fact that Dr. Nick does provide evidence for his thesis. In November last year, the Philippine Business Group signed the Covenant for Shared Prosperity, whereby they pledged and signed their commitment to the following stakeholders. And unlike the US Business Roundtable, they put employees first a commitment to recruit, train, and develop employees and managers to the best they can be, a commitment to provide only quality products and services that are of continuing value to their customers, a commitment to treat providers and suppliers of goods, services, and funds fairly ethically and with respect, and a commitment to actively be involved in the communities where they operate with particular attention to the needs of the disadvantaged, a commitment to protect and preserve the environment for intergenerational benefits by employing environment-friendly technologies in all aspects of business operations. And finally, and only finally, a commitment to deliver reasonable and just returns to and fair treatment of the controlling and non-controlling shareholders. Dr. Nick Poblador chronicles in a magnificent work the changes that are already taking place in our society on the manner by which the businessmen, the captains of industries and professionals 
are transforming the free market capitalism into the stakeholder capitalism and thereby live the principle already enshrined in section six, article 12 of the constitution. And I quote, the use of property bears a social function and all economic agents are contribute to the common good. Individuals and private corporation groups, including corporations and similar collective organization shall have the right to own, establish and operate economic enterprise to subject to the duty of the state to promote distributive justice and to intervene when the common good so demands. There should be no need for government, for our government to use a heavy hand to intervene in private businesses in our country. For the Filipino businessman, the Filipino captain of industry and the Filipino professional understands and appreciate and have taken to heart the social function of their businesses and the professional endeavors and have heeded and continue to heed the call, the goal, the call to contribute to the common good. Thank you, Dr. Nick Lubledor, for the work that you have done. And thank you, Ma, for giving me the opportunity to react to, react to the work of Dr. Nick Lubledor. And good afternoon. Thank you, Attorney Cesar. Um, so let me uh, do two things at this point. I just tried to uh, quickly summarize, uh, you know, the journey that we've taken uh, for the past hour, and then I'll just uh, present a few of my thoughts as well. I'd like to start with the confession that uh, Dr. Nick, my uh, microeconomics, macroeconomics, and managerial economics guru. Uh, 46 years ago. So thank you, uh, Dr. Nick, for all the wisdom <coughs> and the way you have uh, shaped um, people of my generation. Um, I think Dr. Nick was very clear when he, when he said that um, business organizations must only pursue one goal. Yeah, which is the pursuit of profit and that businesses do not have a moral responsibility, but more of a strategic responsibility. And mod, the role of modern organizations is that you satisfy <clears throat> all stakeholders, but the residual value, which is profits or income are directed towards shareholders. Our first reactor, Sani Coloma, I think uh, said it uh, clearly that um, it's really the pursuit of life and not the pursuit of money that we should uh, pursue. That perhaps family is the economic unit that we should look at rather than the firm as an alternative paradigm. And he cited the example of uh, you know, the power of one company to change the world, uh, e.g. Unilever. And he shared the conversation between um, two top leaders to further substantiate this point. Dr. Ben, who is my academic mentor, talk about the reality for the past few decades of market capitalism trickling up rather than trickling down. He used a phrase called mindful profit achievement, that it could not be mindless profit achievement, and that there is a moral argument to think about stakeholders and the government when they exercise their regulation, is we, it, it's assumed that business organizations would have the moral wherewithal to pursue their businesses. And then um, Attorney Cesar talk about that the way to a collaborative and inclusive um, 
business model is to maximize profits for both shareholders and stakeholders. And that there should be no need for governments to intervene because business organizations have the responsibility and have the accountability, not only to maximize profits, but maximize shareholder value. And that organizations are business entities first and foremost, and that market capitalism may not be perfect, but it is more, it is a model that has worked and is a superior option compared to other uh, systems. Um, I may not have done justice uh, to the summary completely and comprehensively, but just, just feel free to jump in later because I, you know, I'm sure we still have time. But at this point, let me uh, share with you uh, five slides that uh, project my view as to um, how, how I see it from my perspective. And this is a presentation entitled, uh, Before It Is Too Late. And let me just put it up. Okay, and I, I'm now in the process of sharing it. Let me just... Uh, Okay, so before it is too late. Before it's too late, there is a black screen. Okay, sorry. Before it is too late. Uh, the, the, my reference uh, at this point in time is a 2021 book by the uh, head of the World Economic Forum, uh, Klaus Schwab. Stakeholder capitalism, a global economy that works for progress, people, and planet. Of course, we all know that this, this gentleman is the organizer of the annual uh, Davos conferences. And he said, in that Excuse me, Mon, this is Ben. Yeah, hi, I ben. seem to be seeing a white screen. Uh, okay, what about the others? I'm sorry about that. Yeah. It's a, it's a long white screen. That's correct. Okay, let me uh, let me stop the share and uh, bring it up again. What's happened there? Um, okay, let me just, just give me a second. Okay, yeah. there, okay, I can okay. see it now. Thank you, MAP. So before it is too late, that's the title. Uh, can we move on? Yeah. So I was talking about the book. Can we move to the, ne to the next slide, Arnold? That's the book that I was talking about, the day boss organizer. And a summary of the book is this. Next slide, please. And that it says that the system is broken and that the current picture of global upheaval and sustainability and uncertainty that could be replaced by an economy that works for all people and the planet, that we must eliminate rising income inequality, which, which has already been mentioned. We must reduce the dampening effect of monopoly market power wielded by large corporations on innovation and productivity gain, gains. And then the short-sighted exploitation of natural resources that is corroding the environment and affecting the lives of many for the worst must end. 
So uh, the debate over the causes of the broken economy is wide open. And the book argues convincingly that if we don't start with recognizing the true shape of our problems, our current system will continue to fail us. So it looks, the book looks for the real causes of the shortcomings, and it also shows solutions in best practices from around the world in places as diverse as these countries. So there are emerging examples of new ways of doing this that provide grounds for hope. So could we go to the next slide? Uh, okay. Of course, we may have seen this before. Um, Dr. Nick talked about the three Ps and the phrase sustainable development as the key to sustainable competitive advantage has been put forward in, in recent years, adding two additional Ps, which is partnership, implementing the agenda through a solid global partnership and also peace, fostering peaceful, just, and inclusive societies. This five piece was drawn up by the United Nations in 2015 and served as the foundation for the 17 sustainable development goals. So could, 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 you, could we go to the next slide, please? So you, you've seen this before, I'm sure, and it's interesting to note that uh, a company like Accenture, especially in the thick of the pandemic, has put the achievement of the 17 SDGs as one of their three business priorities in addition to digital uh, acceleration and uh, being uh, client-centered as they pivot in the midst of this ex existential crisis. So these are the 17 uh, global goals and business organizations have now taken this as, uh, as a key priority. Good example of which is uh, yeah, Accenture and of course Unilever that has been mentioned earlier. Now there are some Philippine responses uh, and of course the covenant for shared prosperity of which uh, my fellow panelist, uh, Dr. Ben, um, is the co-chairman. Uh, the first person is also going to ask a question, uh, uh, Mr. Rex Villon. They're the architects of this shared prosperity, this covenant. And this is, a, uh, this is uh, an organic uh, Philippine response late last year uh, supported by 25 Philippine business groups. Next slide, please. Next slide. And, and again, the, the other example that I could see, uh, and Dr. Ben and I are, um, are, are very much um, advocating for this, is that we have to start them young. It may not happen in this generation, but if we could make an impact by influencing our students and our future business leaders, that uh, part of the new capitalism is adherence to a code of ethics that, that does not only maximize shareholder value, but more importantly, maximize stakeholder value. So this is the code of ethics. So it contains uh, commitments. It recognizes the role. And this is something that uh, the La Salle College of Business adheres to. So at that point, um, again, going back, all of us must act before it is too late. And now um, we'll, um, I'd like to call on, uh, on uh, Mr. Rex Villon to uh, ask the first question. <clears throat> Thank you, Mon, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, listening to Doc Nick, uh, Sunny, Coloma, Ben Tihanking, Cesar Villanueva, and, uh, and uh, our chair for this event, uh, Mon. Uh, 
I got more and more confused about what question to ask. <laughs> uh, because the, the range of presentations is so wide that uh, uh, it's difficult to ask just one, one question. So uh, rather than ask anyone in particular, let me just make a comment uh, because everybody has uh, thoughts about the same thing. Right? The, the global problem of inequality and exclusion that was uh, uh, backed by statistics of uh, our reactor, Sani Kolova, uh, is, is very disturbing indeed. And while shareholder centric capitalism has produced many benefits to the world, it has also created uh, a very serious problems. And to me, what I see is that uh, there are three major uh, reasons for this. One is uh, corporate and executive greed. Second is the callousness of many corporations to the needs of the poor and the hungry. And third, the indifference of people to the needs of Mother Earth. And this is all in the name of profit maximization. I, 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 cannot, uh, I cannot still understand why we continue to uh, bank on the pursuit of profits uh, as the main driver for, uh, for business. No? I, I think in the end, uh, I, I'm glad that uh, you flashed the code of ethics uh, uh, in, in De La Salle, because to me, it starts with the, 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 the because it's so difficult to allocate uh, the shares of each stakeholder in the company's uh, operation. So let me be bold by saying that it all starts with what De La Salle has done. Uh, the commitment, the code of ethics, which is insisting that I am responsible, I'm committing these things. And to me, uh, one way to level the playing field is for us to encourage more and more Filipinos to become more responsible citizens. Uh, governance cannot prevail in a society or in, uh, in a society if there are no responsible citizens, both at the personal level, at the corporate level. So the best corporate governors, the best board of directors will not create a well-governed company if there are no responsible corporate citizens. And nationhood is the same thing. As a matter of fact, sometimes you can have the worst of leaders, but if there are enough responsible citizens, they are empowered to change those leaders as we have, as we have uh, experienced in, in, uh, during martial law. So, so what is the answer? I, th I think it's an individual decision that everybody has to make. Do we want more of the same? Do we want more of inequality? Do we want more of exclusion? Do we want more of poverty, hunger in, in our society? I, I don't think that. But we can change the world overnight, but we can, we can transform ourselves. So I, I guess the change starts with with everyone. And I don't know how this relates to the topic for today, but to me, the challenge of businesses really is whether they are committed to have positive impact in society. And this is the continuing and intentional creation of enduring social and economic value in that order, social and economic. So that is not the question. That is more of what the, the five uh, speakers have said, but I feel very strongly about this. So uh, that's my contribution, Mon, and thank you for giving me the opportunity. Thank you, Rex. Uh, you, you know, you're, you're the guiding soul behind this uh, topic, in fact. Uh, question from Warren, and before I read the question, uh, please submit your questions through the Q&A button. Uh, we're sorry, but due to time constraints, the webinar participants will not be given the opportunity to speak, but could uh, put their question. So the question of Warren is Warren de Guzman. Um, this sounds like um, from ABS-CBN, I guess. Uh, what is the assessment of the panel regarding Philippine business today? And uh, what steps could be taken moving forward? 
Uh, Dr. Ben has already uh, responded on the Q&A, uh, so maybe we let Dr. Ben respond first, and then the others can follow. What is your assessment of the regarding Philippine business? And I, I believe, uh, thank you, Mon. As I put in the chat, I believe we are now growing in awareness of stakeholders, but this will be a long slog. Uh, we are deeply entrenched in our current mindset although we are being shocked by the pandemic and other developments. But business leaders are be, being more mindful of, of stakeholders, but we have a long way to go and we all have to do it together. But I'm hopeful. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ben. So uh, this time maybe we, we ask Dr. Nick. Dr. Nick? What is your assessment of Philippine business today and how do we move forward? Uh, Dr. Nick, you're on mute. You're on mute, Dr. Nick. I can see you speaking, but there's no audio. Dr. Nick. Ako. There. Turn it, yeah. Now we can hear you. Okay. Go ahead. But you do not see me. You don't have to see me, do you? No, no, we can see you. Uh, oh, you can. oh, good. <laughs> okay. Uh, the, the question is very broad, and uh, I really am I'm at wit's end on how to compose my thoughts and responding to it in, in, in any meaningful way. But my the, the main point of my argument is this that uh, businesses are in business in order to make money for investors. Their aim, their aim, their aim as an, their purpose in society, the purpose of business firms in society is to create economic value, to maximize economic value. Okay, to maximize economic value. In the larger social context, yun ang responsibilidad ng mga ng mga negosyo, mga korporasyon to maximize economic value. My thinking, however, is that in order to maximize economic value, business entities must provide appropriate incentives to all of those who participate in the production process to contribute their utmost in order to maximize the value created by the company. I enumerated some of them, provide benefits to consumers, to workers, and so on and so forth. But these benefits, while they are intended to uh, serve the interest of individual stakeholders, are, are ultimately intended to create, to maximize economic value. Having maximized the value produced by the company and having appropriated or allocated uh, the commitments, the resource commitments to workers, business partners, consumers, and so on, what remains, what remains is the residual, the residual that remains is what we call profits. And this is the incentive for businesses to be in business. So we cannot deprive them of, of the right to maximize profits. But in so doing, they also serve the interest of all of those who have participate, participated in the decision-making process. Now, what businesses are doing for their workers and for the community for that matter, while they are ethical in the sense that they, are, they, they serve the interest of others, they are not what businesses are for. Businesses are there in order to create wealth for their owners. But the best way to do so is to create value for all others. We have to be very careful, though. I, I think I, meant, I heard some, some mention earlier that the purpose in the uh, Code of Ethics is to maximize value for both shareholders and stakeholders. We cannot maximize value for both stakeholders and shareholders. We can only maximize value for one, and that is the shareholders. But to do so, value must be created for everybody. So the ethical responsibility of business uh, 
is something that has felt like a, that has con confounded me for a long, long time. And I have come to the conclusion, as I have stressed in my presentation, that business managers, as managers of corporations, have no moral responsibility. Their responsibility is what is a strategic responsibility to create value for their employers. That is their role. However, corporate CEOs, managers, and of course, shareholders have several roles. And uh, what they do with, 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 their, with their incomes, their shares of the business of the uh, of the uh, of the uh, value created by the firm is their business. They can they can they can uh, 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 share their their uh, their wealth and their income with others, which is which is an ethical thing to do, to do good to others. But that is their role as individuals. Their role as managers is to create value for the company. So I have to distinguish between ethical, ethical and strategic. I have to stress this difference. Strategic is intended to serve a purpose. And in, in the business sense, that purpose is to maximize progress. Ethical is to provide, is to serve the interests of others. That is an ethical responsibility. We must distinguish between these two. We cannot, we should not confound these two. So businesses and, and people in organizations cannot be both, I mean, cannot be, uh, cannot uh, be both moral and ethical, at the, uh, you know, uh, and at the same time strategic. They have to be either one or the other. Thank you, Dr. Ney. Uh -oh. So, uh, question from Mr. Ediap, but perhaps I'm directed to Attorney Cesar. Um, Attorney Cesar, how is it possible to address income and wealth inequality? if corporations will focus primarily on maximizing profit as its sole responsibility in the practical sense, how can profit be maximized without prejudicing the interests of another party, particularly stakeholders? That's a very good question. And it, it basically is the role and responsibility that is now being placed upon the shoulders of boards of directors in the Code of Corporate Governance, uh, in taking into consideration the stakeholders' value, the boards of directors are really asked in their manual of corporate governance to determine who their stakeholders are and what are their legitimate interests. That is their responsibility. The stakeholders are led by the shareholders and others. And it is the board acting as faithful, lawful managers to determine who the other stakeholders are and how to balance this interest. And it's not a quick fix. It's not an ideal balance. As they go through uh, their work, they continue to determine that certain things are important more to consider the profits of those. Uh, the, the consideration of the shareholders as a good, uh, as so important. And sometimes they have to reduce it in order to work out uh, a balancing of the interest of the shareholders. There is no magic rule other than the use of good business judgment in yes. each of the corporate under enterprise that's upon them. No magic bullet is placed, uh, is, is given to them under, under the stakeholders. In fact, it places upon them a greater responsibility of being analytical to move forward as ben, ben, uh, ben, Dr. Ben Tianki says, to move further than they're used to. And that's what, uh, that is what the game is all about. No magic wow. bullet. And, and to the more important point of saying that how can you reduce the gap between the rich and the poor? I think many works like that of Piketty have shown that it is the way of the world. I mean, capitalism, the market just creates a greater and greater gap between the rich and the poor. And I don't think that the role of market capitalism is equality, not at all. They tried to do that under communist reign it didn't work. There will always be inequality since the, since, uh, uh, the time of our, our Lord here on earth, the poor will always be with us. And the role of stakeholders capitalism is even as that gap increases, which it must under Piketty's uh, capitalist work, the quality of those who are poor is enhanced. And that's what stakeholders capitalism is all about. 
the bulk of the profits will still go to the investors. That is the way things are. But so much of that is now being flowed down in order to, to make the life of those 90% or the 86% better. Now, you talk about the increasing gap in, uh, between the rich and the poor in, in, the, in the United States. But I tell you, look at the poor, what they call the poor, the 86% the in the United States, they are rich compared to our poor here. Look at how, how, billion, uh, how hundreds of millions of Chinese have by state capitalism been taken out of poverty. So it is not to make everybody poor or everybody rich. That's an impossible task. It is uh, how to make poor those at the bottom line have a better life than they would out of abject poverty. That is the stakeholders capitalism doctrine. Thank you. Thank you, Attorney Cesar. So question to uh, Sunny Loma. Perhaps this is, uh, this is our last question and then I'll probably give the floor to Rico, Attorney Rico afterwards being the committee chairman just to share his thoughts. But to Sunny first, uh, free markets and self-interest has greatly benefited us with economic pro progress. But in, as in any free market, there are winners and losers. This is from uh, my good friend, Cliff Ayala, by the way. What do we do as the greed of business increases inequality and operates at the cost of people and planet? What else remains but A, the moral imperative on the people in the business, because after all, the business is its people, and B, the political responsibility of government to regulate that greed. Wow, what a big question, Sani. So give Cliff a big answer. Okay, uh, simply put, Mon, I think actions speak louder than words. Talk is cheap. It's so easy to write articles and to uh, put graffiti on the wall on slogans. Talk is cheap. If you really believe in something, do it. Put your money where your mouth is. And I'm glad it is Cliff Ayala who has uh, raised that point because Cliff is involved in an enterprise where they exactly did that. It's a profitable enterprise, but they decided to invest in a low-income region of the country in order precisely to put more food on the table, increase the income of people. That is a willful decision taking risk and putting your money where your mouth is. I think that is where progress is going to come from. The courage to do what you say you will do. So thank you, uh, Shaksani. So uh, may, may I okay. add at this point, something at this point? When we, sure. we talk about trying to uh, equalize opportunities and even out the playing field, I think we must realize that there is plenty of opportunity at the very bottom of the pyramid. There is very plenty of opportunity to generate income and to create value for society by addressing the needs of the poorest of the poor. And that is exactly what, for example, uh, uh, Accenture is doing. You mentioned about Accenture. Developing human skills and so on in collaboration with other institutions. Doing so is benefits the very poor, but at the same time, it also benefits the company by re by reducing its uh, human development costs. So, opportunity is at the bottom of the pyramid, and the, and this concept, this uh, the potential for value creation there is almost without limit. Yes. Yes, that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nick. So uh, I think we just demonstrated uh, the power of one. I think our, our desired outcomes are the same, right? And uh, since uh, we only have five minutes left, I will give the floor now to the chairman of the uh, Human Capital 
and Development Committee, Attorney Rico, to share his thoughts. Um, I, good afternoon once again. Um, thank you for um, staying uh, all through this uh, webinar. Uh, it's been a um, indeed an intellectually stimulating um, uh, afternoon uh, with the, the many uh, thought leaders around us uh, uh, presenting their respective views and perspectives on the topic at hand. I uh, probably would uh, just comment that um, since uh, the business leaders in the Philippine scene uh, are within our grasp. This would have been more um, uh, interesting uh, if we would have the likes of the investors, uh, the uh, stakeholders indeed who have funded the conglomerates in the country, uh, if we can hear their views and react uh, to the many perspectives presented this afternoon. I think that's for another webinar. And uh, we will, as I've said, in the committee, in the committee, we will try to address uh, and present uh, stimulating um, fora in the future uh, to address the many uh, topics that have uh, uh, been presented in the survey put forward by the MAP Secretariat. Thank you. So that will be the subject of a future project. Uh, and uh, so watch this space and uh, the goings on of the MAP Human Capital and Development Committee under the leadership of uh, Tony Rico. So thank you, Dr. Nick, Secretary Sani, Dr. Ben, and Attorney Cesar for sharing your time and expertise with us today. But don't leave yet. Thank you everyone for joining us. And may I now invite our speaker and reactors to keep their video on for a short photo opportunity as instructed by the real boss of MAP, Arnold. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. So, okay. So, uh, thank you, everyone. And as what Secretary Sani said, talk is cheap, but the time for action is now. Kaya sugod, mga kapatid. The MAP meeting is adjourned. Happy birthday, Nick. Happy no, birthday, Nick. Happy, happy birthday, Professor Nick. Bye, Nick. Okay. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you, Mon. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Sunny. Good afternoon. Thank you. Good afternoon. Bye-bye. We'll have a good delivery from uh, Dr. Nick. Aabangan ko yan. Sige ba? <laughs> pero, pero, pero ngayon, ngayon, at least dito sa Quezon City, may liquor ban. So, we have to... <laughs> Then, Nick, maganda yung ano, uh, for further exploration, yung bottom of the pyramid. Magandang ano yun, topic yun. Tama. Uh, maraming pagkakataon dyan, eh. Kasi kalamin yung mga inclusive business mo. Kalamin yung mga business mo. Inclusive business mo. Oo, nakatutok talaga dyan sa, sa bottom of the pyramid. Ang naming bankable na bottom of the pyramid. Ano talaga? Oo, oo, mabuti naman at sangkayo kasi ayaw ka doon. Inclusive business models. Yan ang isa sa aking mga advocacy. Sige, next time yun ang topic natin. We will invite uh, companies that demonstrate inclusive business model. Para mag-complete. Ay, I agree. Ako, alam mo yung... yung so, it's a good the, the last uh, portion of the last four chapters of my book is devoted to to uh, creating value for the for the bottom for the uh, for the bottom of the pyramid. So I cite many companies, including Accenture, Accenture, uh, Kenanmer Foods, Jollibee, and so on, all doing as uh, strategic initiatives addressing the needs of the poorest 